Hi, and welcome to Let's Talk Racism, a series of shows created by students from all over the globe. I'm Anna Ashite. And I'm Shay Hayes. We're from Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. I'm Claire Havler. And I'm Fatoumata Diakabi. We're reporting from Breda University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. Namaste, I'm Neil Fudness. And I'm Tapasa Chabur, and we are from MIT School of Film and Television, India. I'm Moon Lam. And I'm Nick Coco, and we're here in HKBU in Hong Kong. We're producing five shows that discuss what systemic racism looks like from different parts of the world. In this episode, we'll be talking about understanding the history of racism in different countries, from stories of slavery to cultural traditions of blackface to discrimination in employment. Now let's get started. Our first story begins a relatively disregarded group of people who live in the city called Ahmedabad, Gujarat in India. During the 7th century, Gujarat's long coastline helped it to establish marine trade with foreign countries. That's the reason the Siddhis, a community that first originated in Africa, first reached the shores. One theory about how they came here is that they were brought as slaves by the Portuguese. Also, they made a rich contribution to the architectural history of Ahmedabad, but now must overcome the odds to prevent being pushed into the shadows of anonymity by the mainstream Indian society. My classmate Aryan has a story for you all. An almost 500-year-old mosque in the heart of the city, where daily namaz is offered, It has always been known because of its most famous feature, the Tree of Life. A window carved out of a single piece of stone known as Siddhi Said Nijali also recognizes the logo or mascot of Ahmedabad city. But I never knew this portrait stone was carved and crafted by the Siddhis, an African origin community of India. Neither did I know about their existence nor were they mentioned in my history textbooks. But I did come across one thing about them in school unknowingly. Not something that was in my syllabus, but a derogatory slang that I observed being used amongst my friends and social circle. Hapshi. Hapshi has its actual origin in Arabic language, meaning from Al-Habash, which is the older name of Ethiopian Empire but it is used locally to verbally abuse all black people who are assumed to be uncivilized and savages. The Siddhis are also known because of their expressive dance form that portrays their community life, which originally was performed as a celebratory dance after a successful hunt. <laughs> The history of the African slavery in Ahmedabad is being glossed over in current times. We don't hear it about much in schools. What about the history of slavery in Canada and Nanshe? Well, we're taught about the Underground Railroad, which was a, a network of secret routes 
um, and many enslaved persons would escape from the South states into the US and into Canada. It's commonly misunderstood that the Underground Railroad was Canada's contribution towards the abolishment of slavery. However, many people who escaped to Canada did not necessarily flee from enslavement. How about in Hong Kong? Yes, the practice of slaves was common before the Second World War. They worked as domestic servants for nothing, and we usually call them Mui um, Zai, which means little sister in Hong Kong. Oh, what about in Netherlands, Flo? In school, we weren't really thought about colonization that the Netherlands took part in, um, but we know it happened, but it really isn't me mentioned much during history class. Also, what I feel is that slavery has been a tragic part of the history or in so many countries around the world and often goes overlooked instead of being really openly discussed in the classrooms or even in the media. You're watching Let's Talk Racism, a show created by students from Canada, India, the Netherlands, and Hong Kong. We're producing five shows on the theme of systemic racism, and one of our shows focused on what we teach and what we do not teach about racism in school. You can watch our shows on YouTube or Facebook. And there are longer versions of all of our interviews on our websites. Unfortunately, the enslavement of black persons is not the only example of racism in several countries. The history of colonization and assimilation among the indigenous people has existed for hundreds of years in Canada. Ryerson student Hajin Lee talked to Dr. Cindy Baskin, an indigenous Ryerson University professor of social work and a former social work practitioner for indigenous agencies and communities. She says, we simply don't teach enough about the indigenous history and culture and in mainstream Canadian schools. We can do better by starting to teach this material right from kindergarten forward. I believe that all children need to, uh, need to learn about the true history of this country in terms of colonization and indigenous people in age appropriate ways, of course. Right, um, but I also think that uh, it they also ought to be taught about indigenous worldviews and perspectives and knowledges, uh, because I think we have so much of value in our own beliefs and teachings that can be applicable to all peoples of the world. Dr. Baskin says the Canadian government often fails to recognize and provide for the needs of indigenous communities. I think it's appalling that. There is so much less funding for resources that we all take for granted uh, and for things like child welfare and education in First Nations communities. It's appalling that we are so underfunded, right, for these kinds of services. And you have to wonder why, why, why is that, what is that about? Why? Um, is this happening, right? Because the impression it gives all of us is that we're not, just not important. We're not important enough to uh, receive the same kind of funding for services that everybody else gets. These patterns of oppression are seen throughout Native communities all across Canada. Residential schools operated in Canada between 1870 and the 1990s. Indigenous children were removed from their homes and families were forced to learn English and study Christianity. Many children experience physical, sexual, and emotional abuse in residential schools. I'm curious to know how Indigenous communities are treated in other countries in the past or present. In the Netherlands, we don't really have Indigenous people, but I feel like we need to learn more about Indigenous people of Canada, uh, the USA, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand. Our ancestors are important. And how about India? We do have indigenous people in India. They're called the Adivasis. Yeah, and the Adivasis faced a lot of atrocities under the British rule. And a lot of them were forced to convert to Christianity. Now they're also demanding recognition of their own religion as they don't want to get classified under any other specific religion. Yeah, we also have indigenous community in Hong Kong where they live in boats and catch fish for money. 
Wow, I actually didn't know that um, Hong Kong had an indigenous community. One of the things actually that wasn't mentioned in the clips that we just watched was the higher rate of suicide in indigenous communities than in non-indigenous people in Canada. And the same is true for black communities, especially now during the COVID pandemic. In the black community in the United States, women in particular are seeing high infant mortality rates with their pregnancies. We're now being joined by Julie's Graham, a student from CSU Fresno in California. Hi, Julie's. Hi, everyone. Like Neil said, black women are currently fighting a health crisis during COVID, but it isn't new. Black women have been saying for a long time that they don't receive the same level of health care as white women. I found out why black, black birth advocates might be the answer for this by helping each other have healthier pregnancies. Black women are at a higher risk for pregnancy complications. According to the Fresno County Department of Public Health, in 2017, black infants accounted for 5% of Fresno County's total births, but they made up over 15% of total infant deaths. Birth advocates, or doulas, and black mothers are working together to change the statistics. When we um, talk about infant mortality and why babies are dying, this miseducation, these fears, this mistrust, and it's just, it's one of those things where they all compile. A doula's job is to empower women to advocate for their needs and inform them of their rights during pregnancy and labor. Many black women feel their concerns go unheard by medical professionals. Once I was in labor, I didn't feel like I was being taken seriously until I was on my hands and knees, eight centimeters dilated, three epidurals in, and dang near have to get a C-section. Like, they really didn't take me seriously until it was the end point. Similar to Tara, I wasn't taken seriously until the last minute. Almost a year ago, I gave birth to Bennett in this room on this bed. I was turned away from the hospital three times. One nurse ensured me that I was not in labor. Luckily, with the help of three firefighter and two paramedic, my son was born healthy and I had no complications. That is not always the case for many black women. A lot of African-American women do not know how to advocate for themselves. Or they do not know that they can have a C-section and ask for a C-section. Or they don't know their, their pregnancy rights. So if you have a good doula, your good doula will encourage you to empower yourself to um, advocate for yourself. Doulas are not the answer to all the problems for black mothers, but they are working to make a difference so more black women have a positive outcome. Here in the Central Valley in Fresno, where I live in California, the infant mortality rate in black children is equal to that of a third world country. How does the rate of deaths for the black population look in other countries? Anna? Well, unfortunately, Julie's, it's the same in Canada. There are higher mortality rates for births within the black community. And during COVID-19, there was a larger number of black and indigenous and people of color who were dying in Canada. The chances of people of color getting COVID-19 is higher because they make up most of the workers who are in the front lines. Often they live with extended family, take public transit, and live in more crowded housing areas. There are no statistics uh, showing high death within certain ethnic groups in Hong Kong. But however, a restaurant that was popular with Nepalese was in a fire last month. Seven people were killed and 11 injured. It was operating illegally out of a residential flat. So there are these issues that are maybe not known outside certain um, certain ethnic groups and only come to the surface when it is all too late. We don't hear much about maternal deaths or deaths among the black community uh, because of COVID here in, in the Netherlands. But uh, since, since the uh, George Floyd incident, we heard about a similar incident. Uh, and this man was called Tommy Holton. And he died an hour after being arrested heavy handedly in a detention center. And they know that um, the police are, are at fault because of his arrest. And that's the only thing that we heard about since um, the George Floyd incident. 
after the incidents of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in the USA, um, we had a lot of lot more incidents in the Netherlands on the news as well. A lot more people dared to speak up about it. Uh, one of the stories was uh, some girls who were having a picnic in the park, um, but when they went to go to the toilet, they were um, held by the police uh, because they looked suspicious uh, because of the color of their skin. Um, they were um, thrown to the ground and um, it was all filmed, so luckily the police was held accountable. Yeah, it feels like people become more courageous about speaking up after um, the certain uh, accidents happened in America. Sorry. In America, our news primarily focuses on what's happening here. We don't really hear about cases of violence against Black people or people of color or death, deaths due to COVID in other countries. Julius, thanks for taking part in the show. We'll see you again later on. We've been discussing health concerns regarding Black mothers and children. Now, we'll hear from Dr. Anye Norum, who is a family doctor and a public health and preventive medicine specialist. She spoke with our Ryerson classmate, Sarah Lee Faith, about how she came to focus her professional research on these issues. For me, it really just started out as I was experiencing racism. My parents empowered me to learn about Black history, but it all kind of came together along my medical journey where, you know, I started to understand that these are factors that also impact health. I think for me, it was really, yes, I had interpersonal racism that, you know, created trauma as a child. And I read about social justice issues and I was inspired by that. But then looking at our communities, right, and seeing the impact that these communal, you know, systems level experiences had on our, our you know, the parents, the, the kids, all of us collectively really influenced my understanding of social justice and health. Certainly those things that happened in my formative years have stayed with me as a physician in what I do in speaking out against systemic and interpersonal racism in healthcare and beyond as far as how it impacts health. Dr. Norum is also the host of a podcast called Race, Health, and Happiness. It's great to see that she's opening up dialogue about how both systemic and interpersonal racism can affect health. Head over to our website to see Dr. Norum's full interview. You're watching Let's Talk Racism, one of a series of five shows created by students from all around the world. This episode was produced by students from India, Canada, the Netherlands, and Hong Kong. You can watch all of our shows on Facebook and YouTube. You can also go to our website to see longer versions of all of our interviews. So far, we've been talking about slavery, government and institutional support for the indigenous community in Canada and the high black infant mortality rates in the US. As we've seen, discrimination occurs in every aspect of the daily lives of many individuals and includes the process of finding a job. Yeah, mainland migrants in Hong Kong face racism in the recruitment process. Since 1997, there have been 1.5 million mainland Chinese moving to Hong Kong, and about 20% of Hong Kong's population are migrants from the mainland China. But their cultural background, language, and sometimes education level make integration into Hong Kong very tough. Some say they face discrimination, especially when it comes to finding jobs. Moon and I produced this story. Let's take a look. About 150 people from the mainland move to Hong Kong to start a new home every day. Many more come here as students or tourists. About 13% of the population are migrants from the mainland who moved here over the past 15 years, according to government figures. Sharon Shen is a financial consultant. She was born in Shanghai and has been living in Hong Kong for one year. But Sharon cannot speak Cantonese, the local dialect of Hong Kong. Sometimes because, uh, you know, we have to face clients and uh, most of them are local Hong Kong people. Because so, we are now speaking the same language, so maybe they don't quite understand Mandarin. So like the communication problem is a little bit an issue for me. It's the same story for Liu Yu Hong. She came to Hong Kong five years ago and worked as a masseuse. 
香港人都性格好好，都对我们好好，都会教我们说话、说白话，嗯，都挺好，嗯，很好。Uh, not much to me because I think uh, as a like, young adult and people like uh, grow up from the same background, so we like communicate like pretty easy. But some Hong Kongers feel strongly about a local identity. Teresa Wong was born and raised in Hong Kong. More than a third of her colleagues are from the mainland. I think there is a little bit of rules or some people who are very deep in the background think that if I don't have rules, she believes that language is the main barrier between Hong Kongers and mainlanders. So, outside and the same, you don't know how to speak Cantonese is okay, but at least you need to listen. Because if people are constantly interacting, I don't have to talk to you like that. So, I think it's very difficult. According to a 2016 survey conducted by the Society for Community Organization, one out of every five mainlanders interviewed experienced discrimination at work because they could not understand Cantonese. The Race Discrimination Ordinance in Hong Kong offers protection against, for example, being treated unfairly at work on the grounds of religion, ethnic group, or skin color. But when it comes to people from the mainland, it's a tricky question because they, like any local person in Hong Kong, are of the same Chinese race. To tackle the problem, the Equal Opportunities Commission is considering an anti-discrimination law specifically for mainlanders. Nicole Ko, The Young Reporters. It's not just mainland Chinese that have a hard time finding jobs in Hong Kong. Ethnic minorities often face difficulties finding jobs as they do not speak Cantonese. My classmate Yanni Chow spoke to one of the victims. Dixon Fusaini is from Ghana. He's been in Hong Kong since 2004. He started applying for refugee status as soon as he arrived but he's still in limbo. Actually, refugees cases were handled by, I, mean, I call it unprofessional immigration officers. Then that person's case had been played with. They don't know how to handle it. There are at least 12,000 asylum seekers like Dixon in Hong Kong, according to Christian Action, a charity that helps them. I think Hong Kong um, refugee assessment or determination system is one of the most longest it's not very transparent and it's very unique that it's got so many different conventions and the durations the appeals asylum seekers have no legal status here so they cannot work and can only live on donations and this can go on for years i mean life being wasted for the old I mean, all these years, like uh, since the person came, if the person has spent maybe five years in Hong Kong, seven years in Hong Kong, your life is all wasted. According to a report by the University of Hong Kong and the Equal Opportunities Commission, about 90% of asylum seekers and refugees say they face discrimination in Hong Kong. The worst? Those from Africa. In MTR, people don't want to even get close to you. If you take a bus, nobody would like to sit nearby you. If you take a lift, they hold their nose with a handkerchief or with a tissue. So it was a challenge for me. Right now, asylum seekers have to go through a Hong Kong government screening system. If they gain refugee status, then there is a lengthy process in trying to get another country to accept them. First, to hopefully have a transparent system, a better system, a shorter system, uh, and a more dignified living standard for refugees and asylum seekers. Psychologically, I've seen clients just digress into a very poor mental health, mental state. Um, you know, and I think this needs to be an overhaul. The system needs to be overhauled. Do you hope to get a Hong Kong ID someday? Well. No, I'm not thinking about that. I give up. I give up. By far, most of the asylum seekers in Hong Kong come from Africa. Over the past seven years, only 2% of the asylum seekers gain refugee status. Yanni Chow, for The Young Reporter, 
Hong Kong Baptist University. Do people of other ethnicities and races face discrimination in employment in your countries as well? I have heard of multiple people that they have been treated differently because they didn't speak the language. I think that this is weird because the Netherlands is told to be this free country where everyone can feel safe and accepted. But I think that there is still a lot to learn. Uh, I don't know if I've ever been racially profiled when I looked for a job, but I do know that there are certain ethnic groups here in the Netherlands that are definitely being racially profiled. For example, if you're a Moroccan named Mohammed, then you probably already know that you didn't get the job. And um, there's even a survey that reported that more than half of the participants stated that they felt discriminated against when applying for a job, and one of those components included race. And how about in India, Neil? India, uh, there is a group of marginalized people called the Dalits who face a similar kind of discrimination as you mentioned earlier at the workplaces. In this episode of Let's Talk Racism, all of our interviews and stories about the history and background of systemic racism around the world. Okay. Our next story makes reference to an old Dutch tradition called Black Pete. Erno Hart Suiker is a Dutch 52-year-old man who works at a police emergency room. But around December 5th, he transformed into Sinterklaas to visit this dozens of families and company. Sinterklaas is our Dutch version of Santa Claus. Sinterklaas helpers are called black bees. They paint their faces entirely black, make their lips red, and put on a wig and costume. In the Netherlands, the population is divided between people who are for and against black bees. However, Erno understands that Black Beat is racist and would like to voice his opinion. Sinterklaas is an annual celebration in the Netherlands. Around December, Erno dresses up as Sinterklaas to bring gifts to children with the help of Black Beat. Recently, the public debate about Black Beat has reached its breaking point in the Netherlands. Black Beat is racist and has to change. Erno, as Sinterklaas, agrees and wants to voice his opinion. En wat heeft er eigenlijk voor gezorgd dat je die ontwikkeling hebt doorgemaakt? Dat je bent gaan realiseren dat Zwarte Piet niet meer oké okay was op de manier waarop we het uh, ja, de afgelopen tijd hebben gevierd? Nou, dat is wel grappig. Ik woon in een dorpsgebied waarbij het multiculturele aspect nog niet zo sterk aanwezig is. Dus die, dat wakker gemaakt te worden, dat gevoel was nog niet zo aanwezig. Waar het niet, dat bij de intocht van Sinterklaas hier ook heel veel Aziaten komen... Eh, omdat ze bij de molens van de Kinderdijk komen kijken. En toen vroeg een Aziat aan mij, eh, ja, waarom is die rare man zwart geverfd? En hij gebruikte daar volgens mij ook nog het woord Negro voor. En toen dacht ik, wauw, op die manier heb ik er nog nooit naar gekeken. En dat was wel een beetje het moment dat ik dacht van ja, ik wist dat die gevoelens er waren, maar dat als een buitenlander er al zo naar kijkt, dan hebben wij een blinde plek. De associatie is niet oké. Okay. Een blanke grote man die rijk is, met een knechtje die zwart is en die cadeautjes weggeeft. Die een stereotypering heeft met krullen, oorbellen en uh, in, in, in het slechtste geval zijn het dan nog mensen die dan een raar accentje doen. Dan kan ik me voorstellen dat uh, dat, dat heel vervelend overkomt. En je vraagt wanneer ben je het gaan kantelen. Kijk, ik werk zelf bij de politie en ik sta meer in de samenleving. En ik heb collega's van allerlei kleuren en allerlei afkomsten. En ik heb mensen die hebben donkere kinderen geadopteerd. En die bevestigen dat verhaal, dat gevoel. Ja, ja dan, kan je, dan kan je ook niet meer omheen. Um, me, with this, how I feel about this whole Sinterklaas feest is I've always had mixed feelings. Even as a kid, I... Like at some point I wanted to join my friends celebrating that we're all getting gifts because we were being good kids for the year. But at the other hand, I was being called Swarte Piet by kids because I look like Black, Black Piet, sorry. I look like Black Piet to them. So um, yeah, it was always, I, I never, till this day, I still don't know like how to really feel about it all. I, I do know that we should get rid of it, of Black Piet. Fatimata and Flora, I never knew that the Netherlands had this tradition. Uh, blackface in Canada actually dates back into our Canadian histories and it started with menstrual shows and theater skits. And then recently in our history, our Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, participated in this deeply offensive and derogatory act of black and brown face. Yeah, just like Anna said, I never heard of this tradition either. And I'm curious to know what the Netherlands is doing about this tradition. 
there are a lot of protests and there have been a, a few for years now. Um, and in the big cities, a black beat is already banned. Um, but in the smaller towns, it's still a problem. Um, there are also people who are protesting for it to stay because they say it's a tradition. However, these are mostly older white men. Uh, is blackface known in Hong Kong, Moon? Um, not much discussion in Hong Kong. Um, however, we have always had a brand of toothpaste, the logo of which is a black man with a top hat. It used to have an offensive name, but after complaints of discrimination, the English name of this toothpaste is now called Darley, um, but the Chinese name is still Black People Toothpaste. Okay, and in India? Um, no, I've not heard about this tradition. However, Moon's example does remind me that we do have a lot of fairness ads in India that are very racist. The practice of discrimination against people with certain racial ethnicities is widespread, well known, and goes back centuries and centuries. Yet the dominant mood among the public and government is that of denial of state social practices. It's only when unforgivable incidents of extreme violence take place that the issue of racism is discussed. India being a country with history that dates back more than 6,000 years, and racism can be traced throughout these years. It really shows how little we have progressed as a society. This story by my classmate Ashmani uses mythology and history to show how society has portrayed its evil and how these portrayals are used as an excuse to justify the discrimination done in our society. Let's have a look at Ashmani's story. Discrimination against someone's caste, religion, ethnicity has prevailed since long before but is easily swept under the carpet and ignored as an attempt to shun them out. These discriminatory practices have been traced in our age-old mythological stories. Long ago in fierce battle between Devas, gods and Asuras, demons, Devas 1 and Asuras were a title as everything evil in the world. Gods were associated with the same qualities like an ideal human being should be and demons on the other hand were associated with greed, lust, jealousy, etc. Even the stories of good Asuras were transformed into them being evil or their kindness were overshadowed by their Deva counterpart like in the story of Mahabali. In the state of Jharkhand, there lives a marginalized tribe called Asuras who are believed to be the descendants of a popular Asura king called Mahishasur who was an evil king and was defeated by goddess Durga in a nine-day long battle. For centuries, this tribe was faced by Gautri from the society that has neglected them for their faith and beliefs. Since they are looked down upon and their major job of metal craft and weaponry has long since disappeared, this tribe has been pushed into poverty where they can't afford basic amenities. Today, Asuras are trying hard to preserve their culture, art and traditions by standing up against the discrimination. Now, if we look at the portrayal of Asuras in the mythological stories, since they are supposedly evil, they are shown with darker skin and are dehumanized by having horns, protruding teeth or deformities and other human qualities that are usually looked down upon by the society. Gods are always shown with milky white skin, slim figures usually fitting Eurocentric beauty standards to view them as superior and pure. In an oldest mythological literature called Mahabharat, one of the leading female characters called Queen Draupadi is described as an extremely beautiful dark-skinned woman and yet in modern representation she is shown with fair skin and is played by fair-skinned actresses. India being a country where almost everyone is brown, white skin is still considered most preferable. This obsession of fairness can be seen in almost every sphere of popular media. India is considered as a tolerant country towards all races, religions and ethnicities and yet in this country 
many minorities face harsh discrimination. There are instances where minorities get abused, harassed, beaten up, raped, shunned for no reason. It is safe to say that India has long battled to fight against racism. You've been watching Let's Talk Racism, a series produced by students around the world. Although we've been talking about the racist past, we would like to end our show with some positive thoughts, sharing how our countries have been heading in the right direction. Starting with Canada, Shay? Yeah, the stories I've heard today really expanded my views on world issues and we still have a lot to work on. Um, in Canada, we're beginning to take a step towards acknowledging the issues within our own country and having conversations like these ones. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, in order to head in the right direction, we need to make systemic change, which starts from within. We also need to allow for diversity and equality in representation, those that in, in workspaces, in educational settings. Uh, we also need to normalize having conversations like this one, even if it's on Zoom, uh, without having any judgment. Uh, there are organizations in Canada that are trying to do something and move towards these goals, like Black Lives Matter. That's really good. And how about India, Tabas Anil? As for India, although the country still has a long battle to fight against racism, there have been a lot of improvements in the system. And even people are becoming more aware and accepting on this topic. What I feel is that uh, it's about bringing a change. And we all know that change takes time. But I'm of the staunch belief that one day will arrive when people or uh, from every race will live together peacefully. Mm -hmm. That's very good. And the Netherlands, um, Fleur and Fatoumata? I think there's still a lot the Netherlands can learn about racism and how we can solve the issues to make the Netherlands more accepting of all, all races. Uh, we come like quite some far already because we have organizations like Kick Out for the Beat. Um, and we also um, had enough signatures for a new broadcaster. It's, got, it's called Omroep Swart. And um, there's going to be a broadcaster for literally all kinds of races here in the Netherlands. So can, they can like identify with themselves on TV as well. And last not, but not least, over to you in Hong Kong, Nicole and Moon. Well, um, I think Hong Kong people is not sensitive enough. Like there is still a lot of room for improvement in realizing if something is racist or not in a um, wider uh, perspective. Yeah, because Hong Kong is really an international city. So we like accept everyone from around the world. So I think that racism is not really serious, but I do think that it's a really road, road issue that we have to be aware of. Thank you again to all the people who participated in our interviews and stories and all the students you're not seeing who worked so hard to create these shows. You can access our show on Facebook, YouTube, or our website with full interviews. Thanks for watching. <laughs>